Good morning or good afternoon and a warm welcome to all. You have joined the session on live or streamed program accessibility, which will focus on the ways that small museums can ensure that live streamed and video programming are accessible to and inclusive of individuals of all abilities. This is the second technical training workshop in module one of the Digital Empowerment Project, a nationwide initiative organized by the six U.S. regional museum associations that is dedicated to providing free, self-paced training resources for small museums. This inaugural series of online trainings and resource toolkits focused on digital media and technology topics is made possible by funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. My name is Zinnia Willits, and I am the Executive Director of the Southeastern Museums Conference. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a light-skinned white female with shoulder-length reddish-brown hair, which, if you've been following along week to week, is straight this time. I'm wearing a red blouse with a light color swirl pattern, and I'm sitting in front of a backdrop of my home office, which is basically a desk and a computer. As the host for today's session, I'd like to convey a few things to our attendees before we begin the program. The Digital Empowerment Leadership Team chose digital accessibility and inclusion as the first module in recognition of the fact that it is often the interaction between persons with impairments or disabilities and attitudinal, environmental, and technological barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. To prioritize digital accessibility is to actively work to break down those barriers. This first foundational module provides training on how to integrate accessibility and inclusion into digital programs, social pages, and websites. Also, in this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute our physical sense of space, it is important to reflect on the land that we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. I'm speaking to you from Charleston, South Carolina, the historical homelands of the Natchez Cuso peoples. Wherever we are, let us acknowledge all indigenous nations as living communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We, the Digital Empowerment Project team, recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society that perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many Native peoples throughout the United States and beyond. We ask you to reflect on the place where you reside and work and to respect the richness, the diversity of cultures and experience that form the richness of our world and our profession. Thank you. And now for just a few housekeeping notes before we introduce today's presenters and get started. First, for anyone who is watching on YouTube, if you go to the Watch Live tab on the Museum Learning Hub website, which is museum-hub.org, you can have the best experience with this live program and be able to see all the captioning, chat, and others, other questions. I would also like to acknowledge today's ASL interpreter, who will be on the left side of your screen, and let you know that captioning for today's program is embedded in a box just below the YouTube player on our website with controls to adjust your experience. The best way to continuously refine our craft at the Museum Learning Hub is to listen to you, our attendees, and we ask that you share your candid feedback with us. Following today's program, you will be sent a link to a satisfaction survey, and sharing your experience through the survey will only take a few minutes, I promise, and will greatly improve our work. We encourage you to pose questions to our presenters, which will be addressed at the end of the program after the presentations. Please type your questions in the chat and a digital empowerment team member will be gathering them and I will moderate the Q&A at the end. We will get to as many questions as time allows. However, we may not be able to address all the questions during the live session and others may arise after reflecting on a program. For this reason, we have set up an online community forum for raising questions, posting answers, and connecting with your fellow museum practitioners on the Museum Learning Hub website, which again is museum-hub.org. If you are looking for help between programs, please visit this forum, create a login, and post your questions. A member of the community or one of our fabulous student technology fellows will get back to you. Finally, to stay connected with us, 
and be aware of future programs, please follow us on social media. We have all the social media channels um, and links will be posted in the chat. Now, it is my pleasure to acknowledge today's panelists, uh, Sina Baram, Corey Timpson, and Anna Chiaretta Lavatelli. Those who joined us last week will recall that Sina is the president of Prime Access Consulting, which is an inclusive design firm. He is an accessibility consultant, computer scientist, researcher, speaker, and entrepreneur. Corey Timpson is the principal of Corey Timpson Design. He is an active collaborator and thought leader in experience design and inclusive museum discourses within the cultural sector. Anna Chiarata Lavatelli is the owner of Solid Pink Productions and has been working in moving image for over 20 years as an artist, director, and producer. You can learn more about our presenters from their full bios, which are available on the Museum Learning Hub website. I'm thankful for the time each has devoted to this session. And now I am pleased to turn the floor over to Anna to begin the presentation. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Anna, and I use any pronoun, predominantly she, her. I am a white person with long, light brown hair, and I wear smoky, clear frame glasses. I'm also wearing giant headphones at the moment. And I'm wearing a black shirt, as always, and uh, there's a turquoise ombre of my hair that might indicate I was a bit punk. And uh, when I gesture, you might notice tattoos on my arms affirming that suspicion. Um, today, I'm speaking to you from Buffalo, New York, where it is, believe it or not, snowing. And I'd like to recognize the Onondaga and other members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy as the traditional stewards of the land. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, contribute to the Museum Learning Hub. Uh, today, we are um, going to dive a little deeper into technical workshop two. And so we're looking at digital accessibility inclusion, uh, specifically for video. Do we have our slides up? Yay, thank you. Um, and so um, first I wanted to um, remind us of the ethos that Sina and Corey shared last week. Um, I couldn't word it better. And so um, I think this is the framework that we can bring to all of the ways we think about using um, uh, video media, um, whether pre-recorded or live. And so, this slide reads, rather than design and develop something and then figure out how to make it accessible, we design with a consideration to all audiences and all vectors of human difference from the outset. And so we'll see how that guides the way we think about video and inclusivity. So to give us um, a strong understanding of all of the aspects of video production and live streaming, um, we need to know our terminology. So I'm going to start with an overview of um, the various uh, tools that we have to incorporate into making a video accessible. And you will see many of these in this um, very presentation. Um, and that includes ASL interpretation, um, streaming Stream captions, um, streaming transcripts. Um, okay, so first, captions. Um, there are two kinds of captions. Um, this you may not be aware of, you might be aware of, but we're going to get down into brass tacks of everything so that everyone's on the same page. Closed captions are optional on screen textual representation of the audio portion of the video image. They're stored in a text file that is separate and in a special format. And it's important to recognize that they're stored as text because these can be read by screen readers. Um, and so if you are using a text to braille device, those captions can be accessible if you are deaf blind. Um, open captions, however, are on-screen textual representation of audio. Sounds the same thus far, except they are burned into the video image. So they are not stored as text, but are permanently part of the image. They will always be on that video. And so there are applications where this is um, necessary. Um, typically, you're going to see this in gallery. That's the most common use. And that's for when you're working with a player that doesn't support a sidecar, as I like to call it, sidecar text file. So it's the text file that rides along with the video file. 
And so this is a screenshot of a Vimeo player that shows a closed caption um, file in use. And so there is an English language closed caption activated on a um, video still of the entrance to a gallery exhibition called Take Care. And the caption reads, this exhibition stems from a few driving questions. Um, this caption is just above all of the player controls. And so on the far right, there is a CC uh, button that is activated and a very tiny menu where you can see none and the uh, words English CC. And you can see that English CC is activated. And that's telling us that our closed captions are turned on. So this is where it gets tricky. People frequently scramble the words, captions, and subtitles. They're just text at the bottom of the screen, right? Subtitles are on-screen text that is a translation of the audio of the source media into another language for access by speakers of that language. And so captions are directly related to the audio language, the existing language of the video, whereas subtitles are a translation. And that might be to provide access to English speakers in the United States if the speaker is um, using a non-English language. Or in this case, um, I am showing a screenshot of a, once again, a, a video in Vimeo. Um, and so we have the Vimeo player controls. And this time in our CC uh, menu, we have three options, English, Espanol, CC, and none. And you'll notice that the CC is next to Espanol because this is a Spanish language video. And so the English are not English captions, those are English subtitles. Um, however, in the online context, the way these things are delivered, it's the same type of file, but it's designating so that the user is aware that we are transcribing the words so that when those words that are in CC, they will line up with and match the lips of the speaker when they're on screen. Um, and so uh, that same video, and so this is a video still, and I didn't describe the content of the still, it's um, people on a beach who are seated and laying down and crouched um, in various positions to spell Yuma Resiste, and it's an aerial photograph so that we can read what they are um, spelling out with their bodies. And in this still, we see two open, uh, well, you see an open caption and an open subtitle. And so these are burned into the video and this is used for um, the in-gallery installation of this video. And so on the first line in white text outlined in black, we see las agendas que existen a nivel local, which is the Spanish language, closed caption or open caption. And then the agendas that exist at the local level, which is a direct translation of that caption into English language for access by English speakers. So that's the difference between subtitles and captions. So then what are transcripts? Transcripts are static textual representations of the audio portion of the source media. So this is now a block of text that can be navigated at any rate you like. So unlike captions, these can be consumed at a rate independent of the source media. The transcript um, link uh, that's available alongside this video, which I assume just from last week it was there, I assume that you can open that up in another browser window and you would be able to scan back if you join this late to catch up on what you might have missed. And so that's just one of a zillion examples how all of these tools improve the ways in which your audiences can engage um, time-based media. And so ideally, and best practices is to place this transcript next to the video. What I'm showing now is a screenshot of MCA Chicago's website. This is a video called Chicago Works, Chris Bradley. And um, the bulk of the page is filled up with a still from the video. It's a video with player controls at the bottom of the frame. And to the right of that is a paragraph of text describing the video. And below that, a transcript that is opened up uh, with the two speakers identified. And the text that is contained within this video can be read at any rate chosen, regardless of where the video is um, at in the time code. 
Um, I'm also going to note that this paragraph of text to the upper right, I'm going to circle back to that, but there's a very specific writing style that's implemented in that paragraph of text that describes visual information in the video. Um, and so there's a reason for that. <laughs> and that's audio description. Um, and so the audio description is description of visual information of the source media uh, incorporated into that time-based delivery. That means part of the audio track. Um, and it's typically added through a technique called audio ducking. Audio ducking is a process of reducing the source media audio um, to bring it down to the background to permit the audio description to be heard. Um, I say example of audio ducking, but I actually don't have one for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> but what I do have is a screenshot of an editing software timeline where we can see clips, of, a, a top track that are clips of dialogue and a track below that with a white line that represents volume. And we can um, below each piece of dialogue, that white line dips down um, to lower the loudness of that track to permit the narration to be heard. And so um, that is just one technique, um, uh, which, uh, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go back. Um, so that's just one technique to incorporate audio description. There's also ways of incorporating description into the script. And we'll get a little bit more into that when we review video production. Um, but going back to a video like this, a workaround has been implemented. Um, I'm back on the screenshot of Chris Bradley's video that where there's a paragraph that includes audio description because audio description wasn't a part of the conception of the video project. And we wanted to make sure that we could frame the content of this video. And so this is a remediation. Uh, technique that has been implemented where we tell the audience what is the visual information contained in this video so that there are some information that can be taken going into listening to the dialogue between the curator and the artist. And so um, going to um, keep moving to sign language. I do have a video example for you, but um, I'm saving it for the end. Uh, so ignore the links, those are for you later. Um, sign language is the last term I'm going to review. Um, sign languages, also known as signed languages, are languages that use the visual manual modality to convey meaning. Sign languages are expressed through manual articulations in combination with non-manual elements. The official working language of the American deaf community is American Sign Language, ASL, which is the, uh, the, the um, interpretation that you're seeing here in this um, presentation right now. This language uh, has equal status and priority within the National Association of the Deaf and its activities. And so to be inclusive of this audience, this is the first language. Um, and so this is providing a deeper level of access and understanding. Um, beyond uh, what captions can provide, which are simply text. Um, and so uh, you'll find um, there are organizations that are tr using ASL as um, primary content. And so there's a series of um, videos that Whitney has produced. Um, I included this example uh, just to sort of flag that there are different approaches to how ASL can be incorporated into programming. Um, but the video clip that I want to show, which I think we have queued up, um, which I will tell you when to start, um, is a video that features um, audio description, open captions, and uh, sign language interpretation. And it's a way for you to see all of these pieces coming together um, in one video. And this is from CMHR. Thank you, Corey Timpson, for sharing this file with us. Um, so if you could um, play, let's just the first 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Play so on the table. This time. <laughs> Thank you. White paint is poured inside the clay shape. In Canada, our culture of human rights begins with people expressing values that matter to them, like the right to vote, to speak freely, to gather in public without fear. Pride parade banners. The right to equality, justice, and safety. For many Canadians, human rights are part of everyday life. But behind those rights, there are stories 
of the clash of ideals. For sake of time, let's keep moving. <laughs> Thank you so much. But just to give you a taste of what these features look like when they come together. Um, so now that we have a glossary of terms and we know what they mean and, and generally uh, what they do, let's talk about what this means for video production. And we're gonna come around to live streaming. What I'm doing is sort of building up a foundation as we go for thinking about what, how these are going to influence the decision-making and processes you have around creating video content. And so um, video production, three phases, um, pre-production, production, post-production. Post -production. Um, I don't know if there are producers on this. Um, so hopefully this hits sort of a few different notes or if you work with in-house teams or hire out, these are all things that you can bring to the table, to the conversation so that you can all develop solutions that work for your organization. And so starting with pre-production, this is the planning phase. This is, we're gonna write a script, we're gonna make a video, this is what it's gonna be about, this is the message. Um, and that script writing process, that designing of what your video is gonna be is a great moment to say, okay, we're gonna make this video and it's going to be inclusive of everybody. Um, how are we gonna do that? And so script writing and audio description, writing a descriptive script. And so perhaps you don't have a budget to create audio description files separately and have a voiceover recording and fit it into the post-production process. You can approach it by writing a script that includes the descriptive content required to convey all of that visual information. Um, if not working from a script and maybe working with, um, as I call, talent, um, you can train talent in descriptive approaches. And so um, that could be training a curator, educator in how they can implement visual description in the way they talk about work so that it's not just interpretation and assumptive of the abilities that people are bringing into the table, but an inclusive approach that identifies all of that visual information as part of their talking points. And then the other thing to do in that script writing planning phase is what are the translation intentions and what kinds of pacing do we need to adjust? Um, as Corey pointed out to me, having to account for um, the difference in length that French and English uh, take up. Um, so if you're putting a video into both English and French, you need to make sure that there's a little bit of space on the English to accommodate the additional words. Um, and so different languages take up different amounts of time. Um, and so giving yourself space to be inclusive is an important part of the process. And then this is also, even though production is production and it feels separate, um, the production planning, you might want to start talking about and thinking about where you're shooting it, how you're shooting it, and especially if incorporating um, capture of ASL interpretation, whether that's being recorded separately or at the same time, and then typically recorded separately, um, making sure that you're considering that you're using a background that's um, sort of neutral, nondescript, um, monochromatic clothing so that we can follow what's happening. And you're seeing the example of all of this right now. <laughs> um, and then identifying the phases of capture. And so um, in post-production, I'll point out the sort of cyclical nature that these phases might have. So you might produce the core content, understand, um, you know, do a primary edit, and then you have to go back into production on the ASL um, uh, interpretation and then incorporate that audio description recording because maybe you're not sure what needs to be described yet because you don't have everything scripted out. And so um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot that can be done before you start shooting to make sure that you have the tools necessary. During production, um, I, it seems obvious, but I like to emphasize quality audio capture. Um, you wanna reduce background noise. You wanna make sure that it's clear and understandable content um, because that is also a big part of <laughs> being able to access this content. Um, and then framing. Um, you noticed um, in the uh, you CMHR, the Canada video that uh, we showed a clip of with open captions and ASL translation, you need to make space in the frame um, for these other elements. And so 
when developing graphics with designers, that the designers are aware that they need to avoid using that lower part of the screen where the closed captions will appear for people using those, or where in the frame you're going to place um, uh, a box or um, a green screened uh, interpreter. And um, once again, during production, don't forget those duration and pacing goals. It's very easy to get into the heat of the moment when you're when you're shooting and and undershoot or not get um, enough description to explain all of the details. And so you have to really remind everyone of the goals throughout the production process. Keep everyone honest. Remind you know your the whoever's you know being your talent your your subject in the video and um, the crew of what these goals are so that everyone can keep that inclusive goal in front of mind. Um, and then post-production, this is the editing, taking all of that wonderful footage you've captured and putting it together. This is the point in which um, there is a matching of visual content to descriptive narration, making sure that you are thinking about that video from all of these different points of access. And so um, if you're doing separate audio description, leave spaces where it's needed to insert it. Um, I recommend editing content from a transcript of raw capture um, I usually send my raw capture out for transcription because then I can approach the content both as text, which removes me from the visual information and focuses me on the content so that I can get a sense of, is it descriptive enough? Um, I then um, will approach it from the footage capture and then approaching it from the audio only, right? So you're looking at each way in which that material can be engaged. And then in post-production, this is where the compositing of um, ASL interpretation happens. Um, ideally, it would be a separate video feed that's served by a player, but frequently it will need to be just like open captions for in-gallery, it will need to be burned into the video. That can be done as picture in picture, um, or in the case of this stream where our images are to the side of the slides, um, it can be as shown in the video clip as green screens so that it's um, really embedded into the video. And of course, if shot in gallery, this is one of the hardest because you need to be conscious of background and framing to include all of the communication in the capture. Um, if you, you can't miss any part of that because then you're missing part of the, the story. So what happened to transcription and captions? <laughs> I see this as part of the distribution layer. It's the final step um, in production. And so this is if you've already transcribed your raw capture, um, this is turning that into captions um, or sending out your edited uh, video for transcription. Um, I've listed a few transcription services, um, human transcription services, Verbal Inc, Rev, Casting Words, and automated transcription tools, Otter AI, and YouTube. Um, human transcription will be higher quality. It means less work for you. And so it's an investment that is definitely worth it, especially if you're looking at taking a 10 minute video or a half hour video that's $10, $30. They're usually just over a dollar a minute. Many of these have nonprofit rates. Um, or there's YouTube, which is a free transcription option. Um, it's built into the YouTube service. It just requires a lot more review and editing because the quality is, it's created by a robot. <laughs> um, and so, taking that transcription and turning it into captions. Um, I've put Otter and YouTube on this list as well. Both of these um, services uh, will allow you to download an SRT file or an SBV file, which are the closed caption files. And it's a special kind of file that has time code tied to those fragments of the transcript um, that have been converted into captions. And so developing a closed caption file can be done with YouTube, Otter AI, Rev, 3Play, Amara, uh, which integrates with Vimeo, if I'm not mistaken, 
Um, and then there are also some free captioning softwares that where you would manually create um, by hand uh, your own captions and Aegis subs and visual, um, I feel like a word dropped there. It's visual something. I will find it and fix it before I share slides out. Um, uh, but I, I actually personally, I use YouTube and Otter quite a bit. Um, I know I have clients that use Rev and love Rev because there's an interface. Even the human transcription will have errors. And so Rev has a great interface. So I hear um, that uh, a, a couple of clients of mine really like for editing the transcriptions in browser so that um, everything matches up exactly how they want and that artists' names are spelled correctly, that artworks are titled correctly and all of that. So um, YouTube's free, so let me show you <laughs> how to do it there. And it's a very common distribution tool. Um, so I uploaded a video called Encaustic. Encaustic is a type of paint. Um, this is a video still of YouTube Studio, and it shows my video thumbnail on the upper left, and below that, a menu that reads Details, Analytics, Editor, Comments, and Subtitles. We are activated on the Subtitles menu item, and so to the right, we have Video Subtitles, and it says English Automatic. Uh, modified on April 19th. I just made the screenshot. Um, and to the right of all that, we have a link that says duplicate and edit. And this is the magic YouTube auto transcription. And so when you click duplicate and edit, it opens up a window that um, gives you your English, in this case, it was English language. Um, I do not know the quality of YouTube in other languages or which other languages they do auto captions. It's improving all the time. And so I'm sure new languages are being added um, because this caption editor looks nothing like the one I had been using five years ago. It's so much better. So we have our block of transcription text, which could be copy pasted into another document. Um, but also edited in line. And so I can clean up all of the words that are poorly transcribed because um, YouTube has called it plastic paint instead of encaustic paint. And um, then below, so, so this is a screenshot where we have transcript on the left and then a video on the right, which has playback and a checkbox that says pause while typing. This is a beautiful tool. Um, and then below all of this, a timeline with two tracks, one for captions that shows the start of each caption line at, uh, associated with a time code, and below that, audio waveform, so that one can match up the captions to the audio exactly the way they want it. I personally prefer one line of captions. The standard is a maximum of two lines, and depending on your aspect ratio and video resolution, 32 to 48 characters wide. I find one line of captions to be more um, user-friendly. I think it's more generous. Um, it's a little bit more work because it, finding the right pacing to make it intelligible can be more challenging. It's a personal preference. And so you'll see nuance to differences um, in, in these, these techniques, especially with so many video formats. I mean, we now have 4K, which uh, it, you know, has another implication on resolution. It's a little bit wider of a frame. And so you might be able to fit a couple more characters in. Um, so I am now showing a screenshot from Otter of that same video clip that I uploaded to Otter as an MP3 file. I stripped the audio off and put it into Otter just to compare the automation and the, the robot's capacity. And so here we see that Otter recognized encaustic paint um, it also recognized um, some names and spelled names correctly, Paolo Roland, the city of Buffalo. And um, so this is the exact same block of text that was shown in the previous um, screenshot that just demonstrates an improvement in um, the AI's capacity. I had assumed that I had seeded Otter. You can also seed with a glossary of terms. So if you have a very technical video or lots of particular names with particular spellings, you can put all of that in Otter so that it can start to map those better um, and get the words correct. Um, I had assumed I had seeded this with some words because there were some particular words that I didn't expect to transcribe correctly, but I didn't. And so it's actually just a better AI, um, which is exciting. 
Um, still plenty of errors, lots of cleanup to be done. <laughs> and so don't, don't trust the robots yet. Um, all of these tools are very useful in this idea that I mentioned earlier, remediating content and um, also building workarounds for when certain things can't necessarily be done or couldn't have couldn't be done because th there wasn't um, awareness in that in those planning phases. And so, as I mentioned, with visual description, instead of incorporating audio description, give that visual information as a framework to viewing the video um, as a paragraph of text so that um, there's more meaning in that video. Um, definitely always edit those auto transcriptions. They're never going to be right. Um, and then the fact that you can download those edited transcriptions to post your transcription and so, um, or the edited captions as transcription. And so there's no reason you can't make sure that all of those videos have a visual framework, um, a captions and a transcript with them. Um, these are all things that can be done to the content that's already been produced. Um, a little attention slide. Uh, so attention, the signing box activated area to communicate for sign, sign language must always be clearly visible. And so this is wherever a sign needs um, is, is happening. That's the signing box needs to be clearly visible. Um, leave space in your frame for captions, especially be attentive to graphics. Um, automated transcripts have many errors. Put time into the schedule for editing. You always will need more time for editing than you think. Um, you can also invest in higher quality human transcription. I still find I need to edit those just a little bit. Um, and then lastly, just a note, animated ASL robots do not sufficiently translate, work with human professionals. Um, and I, that's, I realized that was a refrain throughout this presentation, work with human professionals, they're very good. Um, smart humans do a wonderful job. So quickly before we get to questions, since I'm moving very fast and covering lots of things, live streaming. So let's take all the knowledge we've accumulated thus far and talk about live events like this one. We're in a live event. Um, this is how it happens. One thing that you will just notice, our interpreters switched. We have a new person. And so this is something that you need to account for when you're doing a live event. Duration, it can be a little bit uh, more demanding. And so just like a live event in person, live events online also need to provide um, uh, at least two interpreters to give everyone a break. Um, so there are little nuanced differences that come with live streaming. Um, thank you for the timing on that. <laughs> um, live streaming platforms. So just big framework. There are a lot of platforms out there. Choose a delivery service that has an accessible player and supports all features. Be careful with all in one solutions. I am seeing platforms pop up like mushrooms, especially do you know our pandemic situation, the demand is high. There are lots of developers trying to get a piece of the pie. Not all of them, many of them are, have accessibility problems, um, whether that's just simple web content accessibility guideline failure so that people can't even access the video um, through a screen reader or they can't log in. Um, <laughs> there are so many issues. And so I've listed here some of the, the tried and true uh, platforms that I have worked with. Um, and today is my first experience with StreamYard. That's what we're on right now. Um, clearly delivered via a website and YouTube. Um, and this is a little parenthetical now. Um, we have listed Zoom, Vimeo, YouTube, StreamYard, and then sometimes a combination of services is the best solution. So live streaming and sign language, um, adding interpreter video feeds is clearly a capacity that your platform will need to have. Um, in this case, we're able to have multiple speakers on screen. Um, and so, um, I've noted here again, Zoom, StreamYard, Vimeo Studio, and OBS. OBS is um, a downloadable software where you would have somebody sort of playing producer, similar to how StreamYard works. You need someone to operate as the producer, um, except it's a little bit more uh, complicated. It's a little bit more like the old live stream studios. Um, if you don't know this, uh, live stream and Vimeo merged. And so Vimeo Studio is a development through that collaboration. And it's a very robust tool. I haven't had the chance to personally use it, but the very exciting thing that they're doing 
um, that I believe Zoom also does is multi audio track support. So that if you are delivering audio description during your live event, you could have that delivered on another track. Um, and this is also great for translation. If you have a Spanish language audience you're incorporating, a French language audience you're incorporating, those can be sent out as separate tracks. Um, why this still isn't a feature on Vimeo and YouTube normal? Uh, many complaints. Uh, we need to continue to demand that feature. Um, but I think Vimeo Studio is a, is a really good sign that maybe Vimeo will bring that technology down into the regular player environment um, so that we can have multiple audio tracks and stop having to upload a video with audio description and a video without. Ideally, I think, incorporate the description so that you have one awesome video that everyone can enjoy and comment on in the same environment. Um, oh, okay, I gotta hurry up. Live streaming, audio description, and translation. I just went through that. Providing separate audio feeds, Zoom and Vimeo Studio. Live streaming and captions. Um, so CART, which stands for Communication Access Real-Time Translation, um, an acronym I have to look up all the time, <laughs> is an interpretation service for speech to text. It's the gold standard for speech to text live event captioning because it is created by a trained professional, not a robot. Um, and so once again, trained human professionals are amazing. Um, available uh, for both on-site or online. And so this is your ideal um, caption solution for live events. It does come at a price. And so I believe that <laughs> automated captions, despite the significant error rate, are better than nothing if CART is completely out of budget. And so I've listed three options here, Otter AI, 3Play Media, and Rev all have a monthly subscription model that integrates with Zoom um, that provides automated captions with a bit of a delay. Um, I have found that Otter has the least latency um, or delay and um, the uh, most, it's, I feel like it's a little bit more impressive of an AI, but it's mostly that seeding with content. I believe 3 Play Media and Rev also allow you to upload a set of glossary terms. Um, experiment, all of these services have free trials, so you can try them out and see what's the best fit for your event. Um, most of these services also will provide a transcript, live streaming and transcript, not the same as captions, different thing. They provide a different type of access to the material textually so that audiences can engage the content at their own rate. Captions are there and gone. Transcript is a, a document that gets collectively added to so you can consume the content at your own rate. Streaming uh, transcript can usually be provided by services that provide captions. Just do the research, ask about it. If you're working with CART, it, it can be incorporated into the plan. Lastly, test, test, test. Live streaming means test, test, test. Uh, things go wrong. Um, things don't work as expected. Um, just do a lot of testing, find the right equation of platforms and tools to create the most inclusive event that you can. And I didn't want to leave out um, putting some onus on your participants. Um, participant education is a huge part of successful live events. Train practice with your presenters or talent so that they are prepared to approach their material inclusively. That means describing slide content, using inclusive language, and cooperating with the tech teams to ensure that everyone can do their best, um, that we can deliver the most accessible, inclusive, awesome event that we can do. Um, and so at the beginning of this, I described myself, Zinnia described herself. Um, we um, are going through and describing all the content of the slides. And it's just something that can be incorporated into the way we present. And it only improves the experience for everyone. Um, so why, if you're still asking, <laughs> you shouldn't be, um, it's the right thing to do. It um, creates a, an inclusive conversation, um, inclusive engagement around the content. That means that like we're all on the same YouTube page together, dialoguing together about the content. 
Um, the video content is more usable for everyone with these features. Um, if I don't have you know, uh, my headphones with me, I can watch a video silently. Um, and it's more findable. Um, it improves search engine optimization, SEO, this phrase you probably hear a lot, and people are gonna find your content more easily. And if you really need another reason, it's the law. Um, but I wanna close with do your best. We're learning together. This is a huge learning process. We're gonna make mistakes and we're gonna use the wrong platform, but we're gonna learn something from it. Every single thing I have looked at in preparation for this and every single piece of work I have made, I would go back and do differently. Um, and so a big piece of that learning process is communication, manage expectations, clearly explain your program offering and how attendees might engage with it, identify the available modes for accessing the content, how those features can be accessed, what might not work ideally, what to do if something isn't working as you expect it to or they expect it to, and uh, provide a means of gathering feedback. The audiences you want to include will probably have some great ideas of what could be done better next time. And so I think it's all about learning together and doing the best we can together. And we're gonna develop new ways of doing things. We're developing new ways of doing things all the time, um, which is really exciting um, because I think we're gonna continue to develop new modes of video production, new modes of doing online events that make a better experience for everyone. And so, uh, to give us at least 15 minutes for questions. Let me wrap it up and get Sina and Corey to join me for Q&A. I'm a little out of breath. <laughs> okay, that was, that was wonderful, Anna. And I, I just have to say that um, it's a constant learning process for, for everybody, for me too, with SEMC, because when you were doing your visual description of yourself and you noted that you were wearing glasses, I was like, I've done <laughs> visual description so many times and I never, by the way, everyone out there, I'm also wearing black rimmed cat eye glasses. And so Fabulous I, glasses. <laughs> we can really, I think we can really all learn from each other and this type of interaction um, Absolutely. You know, in these spaces to say, okay, I, I didn't do that last time, but now I'm never going to forget it. So thank you for that. Um, and it's nice to have Sina and, and Corey back here with us for questions. So the, there's a bunch of questions. They sort of run the gamut from very specific to, to broad. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with this first one. Where can I find guidance or best practices for writing alt text for images and graphics in mobile apps, especially for photos with and without captions and illustrations? And then also, is it redundant to have alt text describing an image that has a caption? I'll, I'll take a first crack at that. I suppose this is Sina. Um, just an audio check to make sure you can hear me, Anna, yes? Yep, absolutely. Awesome. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so the caption versus visual description thing is really important. Captions are for everyone. They uh, should be made accessible on, for example, a web page or a mobile app and uh, are not the visual description of the image. They might say something like Grand Canyon 2015 or might identify some of the people in a photo. Uh, the visual description is is that alt text that you're talking about, and that should be programmatically associated. There's usually an alt text field or in mobile apps like on iPhone or Android. There's a programmatic way to put that in or in WordPress. Um, so just to note that the caption and the visual description are never redundant because captions are for everyone. Visual descriptions are the visual, uh, alt text is the visual descriptions uh, that are most useful for someone who may not have access to the image, but also really helpful for somebody on a low bandwidth connection that has images turned off. Um, to tell if you have really good alt text or not, disable the images, and does the interface still make sense? If it does, then you've done a good job with, with alt text. Uh, some standards that we can share out as links, uh, the Cooper Hewitt guidelines are uh, public, and uh, if I recall, the MCA guidelines may also be uh, public as well, so we can point to the, the Coyote resources on um, uh, for those as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sina. Um, I'm gonna move on to this next question. Is green the preferred color for a background screen or can it be any plain background? 
I think that refers to a green screen, Anna. If you want to, yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look to to Corey on this one a little bit too because I have less um, experience um, incorporating that. But I would say typically a neutral background. I I like to go for um, a medium gray personally. But just to clarify, yeah. the green screen is the like that the may just be conflated. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it depends what we're using this for. If we're going to overlay this onto another video, then certainly um, working in post production with a green screen, you know, works really well. Um, so what we're always trying to do though is have a high contrast between the foreign background. So the same things we kind of talked about last week, and if you weren't uh, in attendance to that session, but like ensuring high contrast, whether it's text on a background, a person on a background, text on an image. Or in this case, when we're talking about, say, interpretation, which is a, a video on a video or an image on a moving image on a moving image, we want to ensure as much high contrast as we can. So um, the green screen that you're seeing here helps provide that because the interpreter is wearing black. Um, and so it's quite high contrast. And then if we wanted to take that interpretation and drop that and overlay that onto another image, then working with the green screen is quite effective for that. It does allow for the most flexibility because you can decide later <laughs> how you're going to uh, composite it. Thank you all. Um, this is a question for Anna. I'm still unsure on how you add audio description into the video. Can you explain that again? Oh, OK. Um, so I tried to go through a few approaches probably way too fast. Um, there are there is the approach that was shown in the video where there is a, a description is scripted and recorded separately and integrated into the edit in post production. Um, so in moments of pause between um, narration, uh, a different voice, hopefully, um, I, you know, that should contrast with your narrator's voice. Um, will describe the visual information. Um, so that's one approach. Um, typically, this is where audio ducking is used so that that describer's voice is better heard um, uh, and the source audio doesn't interfere. And then the other approach I described, which I may have uh, emphasized more because it's a very budget-friendly approach and a great way to get started. Um, it doesn't require a rethink of your production process is to incorporate description into the script writing process. And so that means any visual information that will be in the video is described as well as whatever interpretive narration um, that matters. And so it's um, depending on the type of video, different approaches um, will be better fits. And Corey, you probably have more to add to that. I don't, or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was actually getting the resources for those different, um, um, like all text uh, captions, et cetera. Um, um, no worries. To, yeah. But, I'll, um, I'll add one. I'll add one quick yeah. thing. Um, depending on the type of video, uh, it really depends on whether or not you can naturally embed the audio description. Absolutely. And so, for for example, for Anna's presentation just now, we wouldn't need any third party audio description. The few she had some screenshots. She described them. There was a visual description of of herself uh, at the beginning uh, when she had a photo on the screen. She said what it what it was. That that sort of thing. On the other hand, if you've got an action sequence, um, you may not be able to, to to make that happen right so two cars chase each other down a busy uh los angeles highway is an audio description that would be necessary because that may not be able to be incorporated into the video so that's that production choice that that anna is referring to the how on on how to do that is also dependent on your video production methodology are you using final cut are you using premiere are you uh just shooting a video on an ipad all of these all of these mechanisms of producing and capturing the video then affect how you get that secondary audio track into the video. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have time for, I think, two more questions. So can you edit previously published video on your YouTube channel in order to update past videos to be more inclusive? Hmm. Hmm. Um, 
Wait, up. I think it regenerates the ID. That's a really good question. I, I mm. don't know that you can modify a published video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's more of a YouTube question, so we don't want to steer you wrong. Then it is an accessibility one. It's an excellent question. Um, I, yeah, you would you would hate to lose all the discourse around your primary asset if you have to edit and replace that asset. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really not sure. And it probably changes slightly from platform to platform. I was going to say Vimeo supports version control. You can replace files on Vimeo and keep all of your interactions. Um, YouTube, last I checked, does not. Um, that matches my everything. Yeah. Um, so this is another reason I prefer Vimeo. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the the you know what you can do in YouTube is is add captions to existing videos. Yes. Um, you can go in and edit those automated captions to make them more correct. And also, if you do have a described version of that video, which you'd have to describe anyway, as a, you'd have to produce separately as a video anyway, if you're going to have two different versions, because YouTube doesn't support that language yeah. track feature that Anna said, what you could do is edit the description of the video to put in the link to the described version. That way, somebody going to it could at least have access to the more accessible version of the video. True. OK. Boy, we're running out of time and the questions just keep coming in. So now I, I mean it, we're going to do two questions. <laughs> um, but this one, uh, my organization shares live stream video on the natural environment. Often this runs for many hours and months of the year. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for making videos like this more accessible? Write a $500,000 grant and let's get a crowdsourcing project in place for that. It sounds like an <laughs> awesome project. It sounds so fun. Yeah. I would. I would participate. I'd like <laughs> describe her hour every day. You know? <laughs> people people watch each other play video games on Twitch. We can definitely get folks excited about <laughs> describing nature. Exactly. Okay, and then I think in the interest of time, this will be our final question, but it's I would address it to each of you and maybe you can um, each weigh in. But the, the questioner asks, I've been working with companies to gather quotes for captioning services for our annual conference. What services should I focus on budget-wise in order to provide as much accessibility as necessary? I'm new to this area and I don't want to leave anything out, but also need to be mindful of budget capabilities. Anna, I think you had that list on that slide. I don't know if it's easy to bring that up again uh, in oh. our current context, but we'll share the slides for sure with the list of vendors. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, the gold standard is CART. Um, I, um, did, uh, run the tech for a conference where there was no budget for, um, platform, uh, expansion. And so we used Otter. Um, there were some significant errors, um, mm -hmm. some words that I wouldn't want <laughs> used, um, and some meaning lost. Um, fortunately we had a really cooperative community that worked with that and and you know community you know use the chat to amend errors um but um of the services i found otter to be um and, and this was because we were using zoom specifically and so it also depends on what your delivery platform is and so um i would check out each of these options and see what integrates with the tools you're using the best. I don't know. And, and maybe one just additional tactic outside of surfacing affordances for the event would be surfacing as much information about the event as you can before the event takes place. So that could be a pretty good mitigation tactic um, that could help manage expectations. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about that last week as well, like managing your audience's expectations before they arrive. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, using the platforms you have, like your website and social media, et cetera, to just try and provide as much context and information about the event, its logistics, how, um, you know, accommodations will be surfaced, et cetera, before it takes place. That will go a long way as well, uh, in addition to, you know, the affordances and, and picking which ones you can perform and, make, and which ones you can't. Make sure to tell people that they are automated. That way, when those mistakes that Anna is talking about come up because of automated transcription, folks have an understanding that, oh, okay, this was an automated thing. So that it, it doesn't excuse the error, but at least it contextualizes it for people. So setting those expectations like Corey's talking about. Thank you all. We are at time. Um, just 
really a wonderful presentation. And I swear I didn't ask that last question, even though I do run conferences, but it's good, it's good information for all of us here. We're always learning. Um, I would like to say thank you to Anna, Corey, Sina for being with us today. And thank you to all of you for attending this technical introduction um, to digital accessibility and inclusion and live streaming. Um, and really terrific presentation and wonderful practical takeaways. So just a few final reminders um, as we wrap up here. Um, if you missed any of this session due to you know, various reasons or you just want to watch it again, you can access the recording on the Museum Learning Hub website, which is again, museum-hub.org. And it will be under the recent webinars tab at the top of the page. Um, please complete the post-event survey and feedback form, which you will receive via email. Uh, visit the forum on our website at, again, museum-hub.org to ask any of your questions because we didn't, there were probably four or five that we couldn't get to. So um, we can put those back in the forum to get them answered for you. Um, please follow us on social media. And then please join us next Thursday, which is April the 29th for the third and final technical workshop in module one, um, accessibility and digital collections. So this session will once again feature uh, two of today's presenters, Sina and Corey will be back with us. And the final workshop in the digital accessibility and inclusion module will focus on digital collections from the time an object is acquired, catalog, entered into the database, to when and how it is published online, there are many opportunities to ensure that collections are accessible and encourage exploration and participation by all. So I will be here with you again for the final, um, the final session in module one next week, and we really hope you will join us. And thank you all, thank you our presenters again, and we'll see you next week. Bye everybody. Thank Bye. you.